Welcome everyone. This is the World Beyond War Cow Foundry Chapter presentation. We're honored to have Norman Solomon of Roots Action with Make War Visible and End It. Um, can you hear that dinging? Here's how to turn it on. Okay. Just a second, we're getting rid of it. Thank you all for being here. And if you can please keep introducing yourselves. Um, yeah, it looks like we'll just hopefully settle this in another minute or so. There we go. Okay, I want to thank Catherine, who's here to help me, who got rid of the dinging so we can now begin our webinar. Um, My name is McGregor Eddy, and I am here to introduce with Diana and Ross, introduce Norman Solomon, a couple tech things for is that comments in the chat, put your questions in the chat and we will collect them and add them at the end. You can ignore, enable closed captioning if you like. And we are very glad to have you here. And I want to introduce Ross Heckman, who's going to tell you a little bit of the California chapter of World Beyond War, and then we will introduce uh, Norman Solomon. So this is Ross and... Hello, uh, I'm Ross Heckman. I'm a member of the steering committee of California for a World Beyond War. I'm so glad you're all able to be here tonight. And uh, thanks McGregor for for those uh, slides that you put together, I appreciate it very much. There is a logo of our national organization of which we're a chapter, World Beyond War, a global movement to end all wars. Our goal is war abolition. Next slide, please. Just a second. Well, you go on talking, Ross. Tell them about it while we work on the pictures. Okay. Um, now, World Beyond War was established uh, about 10, a little over 10 years ago. And um, it's it describes itself more fully on its website as a, a global nonviolent movement to end all wars and establish a just and sustainable peace principally through three means, education, activism, and media outreach. It has dozens of chapters throughout the world and nearly a hundred affiliates, including many here in California. And what sets World Beyond War apart from other organizations, it has a holistic uh, opposition to the institution of war itself, uh, focusing not just on one specific war, praiseworthy as that is, but on trying to undermine uh, the institutions that support war. Cal now our chapter here in California was started, was commenced uh, just right around the time of the COVID-19 uh, restrictions set in, uh, about the summer of 2020. And we started out uh, as, of, of necessity, we started out as a, um, as a uh, group online and, um, uh, we have met online since then. Some of our activities have included uh, peace education programs with a guest speaker, uh, the Peace Studies Book Club, and uh, a peace billboard Something? in the Palm Springs. Uh, that The message on the board was 3% of U.S. military spending could end starvation on Earth. And uh, the... Uh, We've protested the missile test at Vandenberg Space Force Base near Lompoc, California, uh, organized to recognize Cathedral City as a, California as an international city of peace. Yeah. Um, so we've promoted the, just... the, the Peace Flag Project, which was a global peace art project conceived and organized by chapter member Runa Ray, and which invites participants to submit canvases displaying what peace means to them. Uh, we've also campaigned 
to pass the California peace budget resolution to move some of the hundreds of billions of our tax dollars from militarism to human and environmental needs. And uh, McGregor has been kindly showing some of the slides of some of our affiliates oh. um, <laughs> that are located here in California. We have affiliates throughout the country, uh, but uh, these are the ones that happen to be located in California, that the, one, the slides that she's slowing, uh, showing tonight. And we're proud that some of the members of these affiliates even are attending tonight. And uh, we're, we're so glad you're here. And we're so glad to be in touch with one another. So consider joining uh, our organization. It's not, com it's not competitive with yours. It's a state, we're just, um, we're, we support each other. We're an online group that will help support you and your local efforts in your local group. Uh, we're a statewide network. We can help each other. Just join the mailing list. You won't be flooded and to get a feel for what our organization is like and um, see how we can help each other uh, in the state of California to help abolish war. Uh, thanks very much. And I um, wanted to take a minute to um, introduce Norman Solomon, but beforehand, just share a few things. Uh, first, like to say that I'm calling in from um, Southern California, unceded Chumash land. And I'd like to especially acknowledge California for a World Beyond War and the Roots Action Education Fund for co-sponsoring this event. Um, and also wanted to start by sharing again, warmest thanks to all of you for being here. Um, a big thank you, of course, to our honored speaker, Norman Solomon. And I just wanted to say that in heartaching times like this, um, with the genocide in Gaza and the continued growth of the madness of the US military, industrial, congressional, media complex, and more, um, I believe that we as anti-militarism and just peace advocates are deeply grateful for one another for the support and solidarity that we share. So again, thank you all for being here. And I think we especially are grateful to our fearless leaders like Norman Solomon, who've been carrying the torch for this kind of work for decades. So really, really grateful. And then um, before Norman starts, just a brief int introduction. Um, Norman Solomon is co-founder of and the national director of Roots Action. Norman founded the Institute for Public Accuracy in 1997 and is its executive director. He's been immersed in anti-war, social justice, and environmental movements since the late 1960s. And he's the author of a dozen books, including War Made Invisible, War Made Easy, and Made Love Got War. Um, just really, again, very much honoring your work and your being here tonight. And please take it away, Norman. Thank you. Well, thanks so much to everybody who's made our gathering here possible. And that means everybody uh, who is online at the moment. It's really a reality that nothing happens without people working together. And when I think about first learning that a group called World Beyond War was being founded about a decade ago, there was, so to speak, nothing in terms of an organization. And the way that it has grown is because people have seen the need and worked together and perceived that like a garden, it can grow from just very small seeds. And when we think about how international World Beyond War is, and the recognition that a lot of the problems are manifested locally and nationally in terms of uh, supporting, uh, sustaining the death machine of militarism, and then national policy on the one hand. And of course, we are in the country that is the most powerful military force on the planet. And at the same time, international work is just essential. So I think there's that dialectic going on all the time where we here in the United States are recognizing and acting upon the challenge of confronting the US government, the Pentagon, the massive military spending and foreign policy, and at the same time recognizing that we're about 4% of the world's population and that connecting with people around the globe is absolutely essential because no matter how much the corporate media and politicians uh, are uh, trying to divert attention from the fact we're all in this together, all 8 billion of us. And so when I 
proceed here to talk for, for a while and then looking forward to your, your questions and comments, I'd like to address sort of a conceptual overview and then nuts and bolts about how we as activists can be more effective in overcoming the barriers that corporate media present and government messaging presents barriers to us really reaching each other, wider uh, audiences, people who are around the country and elsewhere in the world who are eager as uh, uh, somebody in the souk in Tehran told me many years ago, everybody in the world, with very few exceptions, wants peace, and it's our governments that are getting in the way. Speaking of getting in the way, as we organize, as we try to do outreach to the public, we encounter a lot of walls. The metaphor of walls, I think, is appropriate because the walls that exist through corporate media, which I include National Public Radio and uh, PBS, those walls have cracks in them. And so it's not as though they have no uh, way of yielding to our pressure. Just because there are walls, it doesn't mean there aren't cracks. By the same token, you flip that over, just because there are cracks, it doesn't mean there is not a functioning propaganda wall. In this book uh, that I wrote that came out last year, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine, is the subtitle, I start out by talking about repetition and omission, that the essence of propaganda is repetition. The code words, the catchphrases, uh, what is emphasized, and then the flip side of that is what's left out, the omissions. And sometimes we've had the experience when we make the case, whether to an editor or somebody else, that the news media are not allowing a diversity of viewpoints, including our own. The response will be, oh, I read something in the New York Times uh, a couple of months ago. Oh, I heard something on NPR. And they said something like what you're saying. Well, usually it's a bit watered down. But that said, that's not what propaganda is about, the occasional, the exceptional. That is the omission that is occasionally uh, rectified that is not really dealing with the flood, the avalanche, the usual environment that is the essence of propaganda. So I think when we look at it conceptually, the effort, as uh, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman put it, to manufacture consent is a 24-7, 365 operation. And uh, the Pentagon has a huge budget to do its messaging. The U.S. government in general is, as are other governments around the world, uh, very proficient at pumping out constantly certain perspectives. And so we as activists have that challenge to recognize and to deconstruct a lot of the messages that we're getting. A lot of times, and I can understand this, people say, well, look, I'm not going to read the daily newspaper. I'm not going to look at the New York Times. I don't want to listen to this propaganda all the time or watch uh, the major cable networks. And I can understand that. It's a nasty job, but somebody's got to do it. Some of us have to stay in touch with what kind of overall messaging is coming at the American public so we can understand uh, what the propaganda lines are. We can engage with it. We can acknowledge that it exists and we can develop our messaging to refute it. And in the, the War Made Invisible book, I have a number of chapters about the mythologies that we need to come to terms with, the myths that are so deadly coming from uh, the Pentagon and from, unfortunately, with few exceptions, mass media, the punditocracy, and so forth. Uh, the idea that there are humane wars, uh, that we have the United States that is always trying to avoid war, the idea that somehow the U.S. Uh, has something called surgical strikes, that it's possible to wage war without slaughtering civilians on a massive scale, on and on. And part of our messaging, I think, which can be very effective is, look, we don't want to go down an Orwellian rabbit hole. We need a single standard of human rights. And when 
we have the Secretary of State as he has, Antony Blinken or President Biden saying as he has, many times in the last few years, what we need is a rules-based order. We have a necessity and an opportunity to confront that kind of language. Yeah, what does that really mean? What it really means in practice is we make the rules, we break the rules. That's the ethos of U.S. foreign policy that uh, might makes right, but we dress up the might in all kinds of platitudes and how humane we are. And uh, of course, everybody, I think, on this uh, Zoom call right now is painfully aware of, for more than five months, the messaging that we have uh, been getting through uh, the White House, the Congress, the Pentagon, State Department, and to a large extent conveyed by the mass media in this country to end run, to detour around what should be flagrantly obvious that not only is the Israeli government engaged in mass murder in Gaza, but the U.S. government is proficient in assisting that through massive arms sales at the Washington Post belatedly a couple of weeks ago exposed for more than five months in secret into the hundreds of different weapon sales from the United States, not only kept secret from Congress, but from the American people. So as activists, I think we have this opportunity to keep pounding on this peace drum, so to speak. The drum majors for peace insist on saying that we need this single standard of human rights, that we're not willing to stand on our heads or get into, as Orwell would say, a double think mode to justify the kind of warfare state that we live in. One of the things that we try to fulfill and we're committed to fulfilling as best we can at Roots Action, and I know World Beyond War is very much uh, in the same place, is that we have a single standard about war. We don't say, as is routinely the case, tacitly or otherwise, from the um, dominant pundits and mass media, well, this invasion is good, and this invasion isn't. This invasion is acceptable, although unfortunate. This is reprehensible. And we've seen that in recent years, of course, with this horrendous Russian invasion of Ukraine, not, not only flagrant violation of international law, but killing civilians en masse and also uh, soldiers on both sides dying in Ukraine and even outside of the country as part of this conflict. So I think it's the consistency of the messaging that is so important, even though we do run up against the brick walls. And it's not simply a matter of hypocrisy. We can easily point out all the politicians, including uh, Biden, who cheered on the invasion of Iraq, and then they turn around and say, we need a rules-based order. It's terrible what Russia did. Likewise, of course, the U.S. arming uh, what uh, Israel has continued to do, upwards of 80 percent of Israeli weapons provided by the United States with this ongoing killing uh, on a massive scale in Gaza. And I think we also have an opportunity as activists, as writers, as speakers, as organizers, to call out the flagrant hypocrisies involved. And uh, I'll give you a, a couple of examples of how I think that can be utilized. It's not enough to point out hypocrisy, but it's useful. So in the case of the war on Ukraine, the hypocrisy of the United States should be called out. But that doesn't justify what Russia is doing. And what Russia is doing doesn't justify the hypocrisy in Washington coming from the top officials. Another example that comes to mind is that you probably remember the uh, response to the Houthi forces in Yemen uh, shelling some of the ships in the Red Sea was uh, a couple of months ago for the U.S. to send missiles into Yemen. And for good measure, they were sending missiles uh, into Syria and Iraq uh, against Iranian-backed forces. And part of the rationale was, uh, hey, Iran is responsible. When you arm a military force doing bad stuff, 
then you are responsible. That was the message out of Washington. And then step back for a moment. Well, gee, if that's true, then isn't the U.S. government, aren't top U.S. officials, therefore, responsible because of the consistent arming of the Israeli forces? And often I think we are in a position of the little child in the story you may remember of the, the emperor's new clothes. The silence is often something that needs to be disrupted and part of our opportunity as activists, uh, as writers, speakers, uh, media producers, filmmakers, uh, visual artists, is to break that silence. And I remember the story, I believe it's by Hans Christian Andersen, where the, the king is parading down the street in his underwear, but because he is saying that he's wearing this wonderful outfit, this finery, everybody's afraid to say differently until the child blurts out, but he has, he, he has no clothes on, he's on his, in his underwear. And it sort of shatters that silence. And that's our opportunity to break the silences that maintain the warfare state. Uh, easier said than done, to put it mildly. So many of our organizations are struggling financially. We don't have the kind of people power that we wish we had. There are only so many hours in a day. There are only a certain number of people who are involved. And so often media work gets short shrift for understandable reasons. And so we do a lot of things, and that may include organizing protests, and the media work is sort of put down at the bottom of the agenda. And that's unfortunate because it's the final step in a way to reach the public. I think we've all had the experience of participating in, maybe organizing a demonstration. And it's, it has, a, has powerful aspects. It really has a lot of potential impact and few if any media outlets show up even though we have told them about it and to put it mildly that's frustrating sometimes it can't be avoided no matter what we do but we can reduce the odds of that kind of uh, whitewashing of our actions in media by having more of a infrastructure inside our own organizations or coalitions. So when something comes up, we're not starting from scratch. And one of the ways I think that comes into play is that we might be ignored so often by the mass media, even perhaps by uh, a lot of progressive media outlets, but then something happens in the macro. There's a, a national or local or world event, and suddenly, there is more of an opportunity to get our message across, but we don't have the train running, so to speak. We're at a dead stop, and it's really hard. Metaphorically, I think that's a useful uh, metaphor. It's hard to start a train when it, when it isn't moving at all. If it's moving at least a little bit all the time, then if opportunities come up for media outreach, then we have a better chance to keep it moving effectively. And so that's why I think to whatever extent possible, our organization should have, should have a media department, so to speak, should have at least one person that maintains local, regional, national, international media lists as applicable for the focus of what we do. So if something comes up or there's a demonstration that's going to occur or a billboard goes up or whatever, we're not starting from scratch. Building those relationships is really important. Who is from the local newspaper, from whatever news departments might exist, for instance, at an NPR affiliate, who is covering the news who we could approach? Getting to know them a little bit. What's their email address? What's their phone number? What do they cover? How do we learn that? Well, part of it is going to the websites of those media outlets and see who's covering what. I mean, obviously, if they're covering uh, sports, it's, there's no point in sending them email. And some of those folks rotate around. If they're covering the business section material, then 
perhaps we have a business angle for them, like how the military industrial complex is ripping everybody off while we need healthcare, education, housing, and so forth, and the money's being squandered on the military. Well, that might interest somebody in the business department, whereas a general approach about war and peace might not. So that's, I think, part of what is a challenge that we can at least somewhat make progress on by our own volition. You know, a lot of things are out of our control, but if we can build a infrastructure in our organizations and our coalitions that can deal with an ongoing capacity, I think that would be very, very effective. Something else I want to be sure and, and remember to mention, I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks on this uh, call are familiar with at least the theoretical opportunity to have op-eds in the daily newspaper, for instance, to be able to get around the filtration system. You know, speaking of frustrations, even if our actions are covered, often we have the experience, well, well, we're not quoted accurately in there, or we're distorted, or we're described in the article in a way, or the TV spot that is not exactly consistent with what we're trying to convey. And although it has its own obstacles, writing an op-ed, I think, if we can get it into these media outlets, is very valuable. And that also is about relationship building with an op-ed editor. If, if you uh, get to know by email, phone, in person, the opinion editor of a local or regional daily paper or weekly paper, and perhaps they don't accept what you send, it's an opportunity to say, well, what might you be interested in? What would be more appropriate for your readership as you see it? So that dialogue process can be really valuable. And then there's certain sort of mechanical things that can matter. I think it helps to really look at what that media outlet is publishing. What's the usual length? What kind of topics are dealt with? Don't hesitate to write your own headline. Not that they will necessarily use it, but if you can look at the paper and see how many letters are in their headlines and come in on that ballpark, it really increases the chance that some editor there, if they print and publish the article, that they don't screw up the headline. And a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, just read a headline. One aspect, too, that it's a small thing, but it can matter. Keep your paragraph short. It's not something that would automatically occur to us, but sort of the unwritten convention of op-ed articles occasionally uh, not adhered to, but the idea is that short paragraphs are more inviting to the eye for readers, so they don't sort of wander, get spaced out, and, and wander off somewhere else. You can also ask the op-ed editor, because so much now is online, do they want hot links to document what you uh, want to say? And maybe they'll say yes, maybe they'll say no. Uh, I've had experiences of sending in an op-ed with hot links, and then it's taken out, and then last minute I'm asked, hey, where are the hot links? Because <laughs> there are different departments, you know, so uh, that goes to providing your phone number, your text, trying to uh, stay in touch with, with those editors. And progressive media outlets as well. Hopefully there's a uh, weekly paper where you live. Maybe it's really widely read. Building those relationships as well, I think, is really important. They'll they'll have their own biases, but working with them, I think, is 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 very useful. One other aspect before I I pause and you know ask for your your questions and your comments, is that sometimes the question will come up: Well, should we be building alternative uh, media uh, and concentrate on that, or should we be looking to and focusing on getting into mainstream? corporate media? And I think the answer is all the above. There, There's just such a wide array of media now more than ever, uh, online, in print, so many different ways, video, audio, podcasts. 
And so learning what's out there and what's available, and especially if it has a major footprint, uh, corporate media presence in your community or your state or whatever area you're looking at, all the more reason to challenge them. It's a very Gandhian process that's available. Do the research if you want to go in that direction of critiquing what the coverage is and what it isn't, what's left out of. The Media Watch Group FAIR at FAIR.org is a great model for that kind of research. If you go to FAIR.org, you can sign up in one minute for uh, their email alerts, and they critique the New York Times, CBS, NPR News, all things considered, all the, all the rest of those kind of outlets. It's a very valuable process because what they're doing is doing content analysis, and they're holding feet to the fire of these corporate and other media outlets that say they want to do good journalism. And the response is, okay, you're a journalist, let's do some good journalism. Here's, here's some feedback, here's some critique. And the process can be, let's say it's a local newspaper. Um, Wild Guess, your local newspaper, is not doing a great job of media coverage of war and peace issues. So one thing to do would be to do a bit of research, which is fairly easy online now. If it's the op-ed page, how many anti-war pieces have appeared? Opinion articles put out by that newspaper in the last month or two, or whatever time frame you want to look at on a specific subject on the mass murder in Gaza, the Ukraine war, nuclear weapons, whatever framework uh, and criteria you want to apply to it. And then if you get the data, which is unsatisfactory, which is a really high probability, then you present it to the opinion page editor. And you ask in a very nice way, um, hey, would you like an article to uh, fill in this gap? And that might really uh, pay off. And if it does, then great. You are able to reach people through this outlet. If it doesn't, then it's another set of steps of the, of the Gandhian uh, process. Ask for a meeting. Here's the data. Why aren't we getting some improvement here? And ultimately, getting out the picket signs and picketing the newspaper or TV or radio station, completely appropriate to do that. We sometimes get the message, hey, uh, oh, don't don't protest at a media outlet. Uh, you're trying to obstruct their First Amendment rights, which is complete nonsense. What we're trying to do, if it comes to that, is to enliven and enrich and give oxygen to the First Amendment that these corporate media outlets so often are constricting. And so that's simply another opportunity we have to combine media activism to really make a difference. So with that, I think I'll pause and you know ask for, for any questions and comments. Thank you so much, Norman. Um, yeah, just such a wealth of info. And um, yeah, we've already gotten a few questions in, so that's wonderful. Thank you, folks. A couple of things before we start on the q and I uh, wanted to first, you know, of course, as usual, thank, uh, apologize that there's always a chance we won't get to everyone's questions. <clears throat> and then secondly, to um, thank Shanti Sandosham, because we I did not acknowledge her before. She's doing behind the scenes work. So um, I'll just go in order as they came, Norman. Um, and uh, so first one is, um, people will often act in their own self-interest. How can we frame a self-interest message for a ceasefire and an end to the occupation? Yeah, it's a really crucial question and, and a, a, a tough one to, uh, to answer. Self-interest is often defined so narrowly in media and in politics. An extreme example, but we get it a lot, is, is this good for the United States? We get this in a lot of guises of the U.S. interest in the Middle East. How is the U.S. interest served? And then we can raise the question, who is we? Who is the United States? Is the United States Wall Street? Is the United States the arms manufacturer? Is it people who don't get the health care and education and housing that they need while the money is being squandered on shipping arms to Israel? Those are ways, I think, to flip over the question. And sometimes it's a challenge 
to ask, well, who are you referring to in your question when you say the United States? It might in some way seem like a, an evasion. On the other hand, taking apart the question is sometimes very important. Sometimes we, we need to query, we need to, so to speak, interrogate the question in order to reframe it. Otherwise, otherwise we're stuck, and I think this is, this is a good example. What is our self-interest? Who are we? Yeah, brilliant. Uh, who's the we? <laughs> um, I will remember that one. Thank you. Um, you mentioned critiques of mainstream news sources, and it sounds like this question is actually asking what are some sources that you actually trust and recommend? Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I think we do need to hold all media outlets to rigorous standards. If we're going to critique the New York Times, then we need to say, hey, we wouldn't have the same same standards. I think there are there are many uh, very strong media outlets that are trustworthy. I'm sure many people in this call have have relied on them. I, I'm very fond of say Truth Out or Truth Dig, uh, Common Dreams. These are people that and outlets that we can really depend on to provide us an aggregate of information and perspectives and opinion that's reliable. And we might sometimes disagree, and I think that's that's appropriate. We should not simply say, oh, I, I've suspended all of my critical thinking. In general, who are the sources is really a key question. And the way in which mainstream media manipulate while seeming to be objective is they just shut piece voices out of the article, and then they're simply serving as megaphones or uh, conveyor belts for establishment uh, outlooks. So I think going to a place like Common Dreams daily is really helpful. Uh, Democracy Now!, another example, where the perspective is really an antidote to the poisons that come across every day in the form of objective reporting that really boosts the warfare mentality. Thank you so much. An antidote to the poison. <laughs> writing some of these, um, yeah, just powerful reminders down. Um, so next one is um, a big one. Uh, folks are worried about losing jobs if they speak up. Uh, hence, even if they are in, um, informed, oh, even if they're informed, um, they stay silent. A APAC is actively working to get people fired from university and corporate jobs. And what are some ways we can overcome this? Yeah, this has been just a really terrible manifestation of the domestic political media response to the war on Gaza. And of course, APAC and the, the bogus claim of anti-Semitism that is so often wielded as a weapon to try to get people to shut up, basically. And it is a McCarthyite problem at big media outlets and small media outlets. We know people have, of people have lost their jobs. There was a petition put out, a letter written by some U.S. journalists calling out the failure of U.S. media to confront the genocide in Gaza. And more than a thousand journalists signed the letter in mid-January, and then 30 of them asked the organizers to withdraw their names. And that is a testimony to the fear level, 30 of them. And these were from the Los Angeles Times, National Public Radio News, Bloomberg, a lot of mainstream media outlets. There were about 30 signers of that letter on the staff of the Los Angeles Times. And the LA Times informed all 30 of them that for three months they would not be allowed to cover anything having to do with the Gaza war. So those are sort of thermometers for this fever of McCarthyism that's going on. And during the Vietnam War, people faced a lot of recriminations for speaking out against that. And it's happened periodically. It's a sort of a compared to what? You look at what 
media people in Russia have been going through when they call a war a war in the last two years, and some of them killed, many of them exiled, their media outlets shut down. It's a, it's a real paradox. I just sort of closed my thoughts on this point, I suppose, this way. There's so many U.S. journalists at major media outlets. They, they've gone to Iraq. They go to Ukraine. They go to the middle of war zones. They risk their lives. And then they come back to the United States and they're afraid of the managing editor back in the newsroom. You know, it just, uh, if you're killed in a war zone as a journalist, all you're going to lose is your life. But if you come back and you speak up against Israel's genocide, you might lose your mortgage because you lose your job. So this is sort of the, the twist and turn that we have in our own society. And ultimately, we all struggle to find our own levels of courage in the midst of this madness. Thank you so much. And do you have any further thoughts? Obviously, yeah, the challenge is massive. And just wondering if you have any uh, more on the second part of the question, which is any thoughts on ways to overcome that, like working maybe in coalition to challenge these? I, I don't know. Or any success yeah. stories maybe, yeah, that you well, could share. I, I yeah. know somebody in this area uh, where I live in Northern California who was an editor of a daily paper and he was the news editor and he uh, had an article ready covering a demonstration against the war on Gaza and the top boss said, this article will not run. And the editor quit the next day. That's unusual. Most people uh, will stay on. I think banding together is very important. Connecting to other journalists. If you're in a union, that's great. Whether it's, you know, I mean, the National Writers Union, which is part of UAW, there are unions that members of the uh, various newspaper staffs are in. There's thousands of union members. That's important as well. If you're not in a union still, banding together with other journalists to push back. Unfortunately, though, ultimately, there's going to be sacrifice. If you go public, if you stand your ground, then you classically, as is the case in so many other contexts, either you knuckle under to the prevailing power or you are going to face some consequences. Thank you so much. Obviously a tough one. Um, yeah, it looks like a related one. Um, maybe the flip side a little bit. Why haven't more U.S. journalists spoken up about, well, very related and maybe a, a flip mm -hmm. side, uh, about um, the Israeli lethal targeting of Palestinian journalists? Have you spoken about this to other writers and journalists that you know? Yeah, I've, I've spoken with a few journalists, uh, one stationed overseas who has covered the Middle East for decades and just matter-of-factly said what actually the Committee to Protect Journalists has said emphatically in a report last December and since then, Israel targets journalists. Israel not only wants to kill journalists, but has been killing journalists. And it's a, I think the question has, has a really good point that I hear behind it, which is that there should be much more of an outcry from the major media of this country against all the mass murder going on, including of their own colleagues. But because Israel is a U.S. ally, there's been a real slowness. Now, the coverage in October, November of the mass murder was much more accepting than what we've been getting in the last couple months, which sort of parallels uh, Biden gradually saying that probably Israel shouldn't be killing as many children, women, and other civilians. So it's like going from, oh, it's all great, to don't you think you could kill fewer civilians? Well, I'm sort of paraphrasing as I think it really provides a message for. And journal journalistic institutions are are sort of in a similar trajectory to recognize more and more because the 
the slaughter is just so flagrant, but very slow. And that, again, that's where activism comes in. Uh, journalism uh, is a form of activism if people do it right. Thank you. Um, once again, um, uh, on the on a, well, this general topic, um, what are your thoughts about the current ongoing attack on the platform TikTok, given that it's an important source of media dissemination in the ongoing genocide in Gaza? Yeah, yeah the, the bill that just got through the House, it's, it's a, a travesty. And there are lots of factors, I think, involved. We don't know if it's going to get through the Senate. And I just think it's a, it's a bad bill. It should be blocked, hopefully, in the Senate. Um, I don't think it was the deciding factor, but the reality is that the main first sponsor of the bill in the House was the number one recipient of APAC money. Uh, we just don't, we just have these powerful forces that don't like it when there's democratic discourse with a lowercase d, especially young people, because the demographic is clear. All the studies show that the younger you go among adults in the US, the more they are opposed to what Israel is doing in Gaza. And of course, TikTok is a young, young person's outlet. Yeah, thank you. Um... How will prosecution of Julian Assange influence the work of good journalism in the U.S.? This is really parallel to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. What about the U.S. media outlets in terms of the killing of journalists? And it's a failure that is profound. Slowly, major outlets like the New York Times, the Washington Post have said, oh, Julian Assange, he shouldn't be prosecuted. But they've been slow to say that. And it's not exactly been shouted from the rooftops of the New York Times or Washington Post or, or CBS. And there's sort of a parallel there when you stop and think about it. The fact is that Israel, a U.S. ally, has been killing Palestinians, the vast majority of them Palestinian in Gaza. Now we have Julian Assange facing being on the precipice of being extradited to the US. And it's not a New York Times source or rather journalist being prosecuted. This is a key point. Uh, Julian Assange is not a whistleblower. He's a publisher. He's an editor. He's a journalist. But because it's Julian Assange who exposed US war crimes, that's being treated very differently. Can you imagine if an editor of CBS News or the Washington Post was going to be prosecuted for the Espionage Act? Uh, the media outlets in this country, mainstreamers would be screaming bloody murder, but this is a different standard being applied. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I'm going to flip the order here because uh, there's one more more big picture about your work. Um, backing up a little bit, um, there's a person saying they're curious about how boomers can work with Gen Z to fight never-ending wars. It's such a problem for all ages. And of course, for the youngest generations, the most years are at stake, so to speak. Uh, one aspect which is yet to be um, explored really is nuclear war and nuclear winter. Mm -hmm. The tremendous failure of the largest climate groups to acknowledge that there is something called nuclear winter that scientists tell us would come about to essentially wipe out after nuclear war agriculture. And as Daniel Ellsberg kept reminding us, take out 98 to 99% of the world's population. So when we are concerned with climate, then we have a dual problem. We have fossil fuels and all the rest of that. And we have the extreme of sudden climate change that would come out of nuclear war in the form of nuclear winter. That bridge just is not being built between young people who 
are tremendously concerned and often active on climate issues and the very real dangers of nuclear war. And that's one of the challenges we face right now to, to make that connection. Thank you. Um, there's a general question on how to support your work. Um, I don't know if you want to save that till the end, uh, or do you want to say a few words about that now? Sure. Well, I appreciate it. I've been um, talking about the War Made Invisible book since it came out last summer, and I see it as a tool for organizing and activism, including to analyze what we're up against so we can make stronger cases to overcome the corporate pro-war media. So if people are interested in finding out more, you can go to warmadeinvisible.org. If you can encourage um, your local libraries to order it if it's not already there, and it, it is out as an audiobook on audible.com, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can access the book one way or the other and share it with other folks and spread the word, uh, much appreciated. And um, I think as McGregor mentioned at the top of the hour, I'm very immersed in work at rootsaction.org and uh, we love to invite anybody who's not already getting our action alerts to go to rootsaction.org and just let us know your email address and your zip code and uh, you'll be uh, part of the process. Thank you so much, um, McGregor. I have a question, but I don't know if you wanna move to some uh, questions about, you know, Daniel Ellsberg's week or other things like that. What, how, do you have a yeah, word I would like to say, uh, Norman, You've spoken of Daniel Ellsberg and his legacy, and I would like you to speak a little bit about Daniel Ellsberg Week that is coming up in June, and also looking at his work, because most of us remember him, most people remember him for his Vietnam Pentagon Papers, but his last book, The Doomsday Machine, it's hard to read because it's scary, so I think as a community, we need to support each other in looking at this terrifying issue so that we can end it. So can you uh, speak about Daniel? Yeah, absolutely. It's such a profound book. His last one, Dan struggled to write, The Doomsday Machine. It came out a few years ago. He had a conclusion in there, and this is very much related to work you've been doing, McGregor, of course, ICBMs. This is the lowest hanging fruit to reduce the chances of nuclear war is to get rid of these land-based nuclear weapons. They're the vulnerable ones on hair trigger alert. They're very likely to be, if there is a nuclear war, the reason. And so, as everybody knows, we've lost, at least on the planet, his spirit with us, we've lost Daniel Ellsberg, we lost him last June. And so, coming up the middle of June to mark two pasts that are still with us in memory, Dan's passing away on June 16th, and also the anniversary of one million people in Central Park for disarmament in 1982, and that was June 12th. So we designed Daniel Ellsberg Week to straddle both of those dates, and everybody's invited to be part of that in some way. If you go to the website Diffuse Nuclear War, that's just diffusenuclearwar.org, and I hope you will put on your calendar between June 10th and 16th, there's a huge menu of activities that you could engage in to be part of that national, international activity for Daniel Ellsberg Week. Dan, as you say, McGregor, best known for the Pentagon Papers, but before, during, and after the Vietnam War, his main concern was preventing nuclear war. And he wrote about nuclear weapons to try to shake us out of our social sleepwalking about the dangers. So I would just sort of sum up by saying, the invitation is out there for everybody. Take it and run with it however you would like to. Just a, a few ideas for Daniel Ellsberg Week. And please let us know at rootsaction.org what you're gonna do. Um, you know, uh, David Swanson with World Beyond War, also at Roots Action, is very much involved. Um, 
you could go to your city council or county commission, name a library or a school, Daniel Ellsberg Library, Daniel Ellsberg Elementary School or high school, whatever. That's something very specific. Name a street after Daniel Ellsberg. It would take a battle to do it, but the battle is a way of also raising consciousness and awareness. A number of years ago, I was part of a team that went to Capitol Hill and we had 535 copies of Dan Ellsberg's book, The Doomsday Machine, right after it came out in soft cover. And we had a letter from Dan on top of the book, personally, 535 different letters, Dear Congressman Smith, Dear Congresswoman Jones, this is why this book is important. We're in danger of nuclear war. Please read this book. And you know, when we went to the front desk of a lot of those senators and representatives, and I would say, this is a, a letter from Daniel Ellsberg with his new book. A lot of people behind the desk said, who's Daniel Ellsberg? They had not, they're working in the US Congress. They never heard of Daniel Ellsberg. So this is one of the many reasons that I'm excited at the possibility that we around this country can go to our legislatures, our city councils, our county boards and all that, our universities and say, look, this is coming up in June. We want to get the ball rolling, even if you can't finish it now. We want you to name the school, this library, whatever, this street after Daniel Ellsberg. Also a proclamation. We had several, although on short notice, we had Daniel Ellsberg week last week. Several city councils, Berkeley, San Francisco, Albuquerque, Albuquerque proclaimed Daniel Ellsberg week. That's a tool for us to organize. There are also going to be picket lines at congressional offices during Daniel Ellsberg week. Protests, perhaps civil disobedience. So uh, the possibility is really there for us. I, I'd like to make a way to say thank you to Norman Solomon that does not cost any money. <laughs> Once you read the book, you can go online to Goodreads. You can go online to these, these public places where you can post a review. And it makes a big difference. If you buy the, the ebook from or a book from Amazon, they will post your review there and it does get read a lot. And I don't usually like to buy from Amazon, but for the purpose of publishing a review, it's a specific strategic tactic. So read Norman's Solomon's book and review it and pass the word. Get, buy an extra copy and donate it to your library. That is the most valuable thing that we can do to get this word spread along with all of the peace work that we do here at World Beyond War in the three pillars, education, nonviolent resistance, and media outreach. And I think it's very important that we end on time to keep our commitment to the people for a one hour program. If you stay on for a few minutes, I will be available to answer questions about World Beyond War and specific things, but I want to be able to release our guest and tell you, thank you so much. And remember, Norman Solomon is at Roots Action. Go check out that material. He's with Diffuse Nuclear War and the Daniel Ellsberg Week and a fearless fighter to get the truth into the media. So don't give up. It's an honor to have you on. I want to thank all of you for being tonight. You fill my heart with hope. A few of you have comments you want to make. Stay later. I will take you then. But I want to formally close the evening and say, John, everybody take off your mute and say goodbye, including Ross and Diana and Chastry and everybody. So go off mute and talk. Oh, I have to unmute you. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> thank you so much, Norman. Thanks, a lot. Oh, thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank, you so much, thank, thank you, Norman. Thank, thank you, McGregor. Thank you, we'll be on more. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> thank you. we'll be in touch. Take care. Best of luck. Thank yes. you.